All right. Hello, everyone. Who does that now? Thank you for coming out to the first talk of the 2021 series of How Do We Go Forward? How Do We Go Back? My name is Dr. Sam Kennedy. My pronouns are they and them. And I am speaking to you from the stolen land of the Creek Nation, now known as Tuscaloosa, Alabama. <laughs> how do we go forward? How do we go back? Began as a way for us to think about returning to dance and academia in the fall of 2020. This summer offers us a chance not only to reflect on the last year, but to think about how we can change our communities as we move forward into another academic year. For those of you who don't know how this series works, every week I invite two guests to have a conversation with each other about one element of the topic. Um, would you mind muting? Here's the I'm talking. There we go. Um, I invite two guests to have a conversation with each other about one element of this broader topic. After 30 minutes, I'll invite everyone to turn on their cameras and unmute, mute, and the floor will be open to questions and discussion. Everything is recorded. Um, when I thought about topics for this first series, I knew that absolutely I had to start with virtual events. And so I am just absolutely thrilled that my guests tonight are Tova Moreno and Dr. Jay Mundiger. Tova has been part of the social dance scene since 1997 with a serious focus on Argentine tango for the first decades of that time. From dancing, teaching and performing to organizing nationally renowned festivals and DJing as DJ Rubia. In the past decade, she's expanded to other partner dance forms, three favorites being Lindy Hop, West Coast Swing and Fight Dancing. Most recently, she's been influenced by feminine movement courses and an emotional healing movement practice from Mama Jane's School of Womanly Arts. When COVID lockdown began in March 2020, Tova began hosting daily six song dance parties on Zoom, cathartic movement journeys to release challenging emotions and move into joy and play, which she still hosts and DJs four times a week. As an MC, her favorite gig ever was MCing her ex-husband and friend's wedding to his wonderful bride. She feels a deep calling to be a catalyst for love, social justice, healing, pleasure, and play. Dr. Jay Mundinger is a social dancer, DJ, lighting designer, and the artistic director for Center Social Dance, a fusion dance community based at Penn State. Dance gave him his career, his partner, his health, and his happiness. To pay back this debt, he developed broad experience as a crisis organizer. He guided his local, local fusion community through rebuilding after the sudden loss of all major dance venues, then guided the national fusion community through the transition to virtual dance during the pandemic. Last March, he quickly moved CSD online, becoming a virtual community that now boasts regulars from 22 states and three continents. An academic background in color science and psychophysics empowered Dr. J to rapidly prototype virtual events, developing new forms of dance engagement and a new style of virtual DJing. A new teaching partnership with Antoinette Alfano, a deaf dancer from Rochester, provided CSD dancers with much needed visual only communication. Dr. J captured virtual CSD in a guide, allowing the ideas to spread quickly and enable him to retrain countless organizers and DJs for the virtual environment. Welcome wholeheartedly to Tova and Jay. How is it going for both of you? It's going well. It's nice to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, thank you. This is, this is a fun opportunity. I'm excited to see what we will create here. Oh, yes, it's going well. <laughs> so Tova, you said you were still doing four virtual events a week and Jay, you're running virtual CSD. How is that like what is virtual what tell me about those virtual events? What are you doing? What's worked? What hasn't? I'll start with first. Um I have recently moved down to two virtual events a week because yes, the world is opening up really quickly. And I am on that place of like, how much do I want to stay home DJing, DJing virtual things and how much do I want to be out in the world? Um, so I just want to make that note. Yeah, that's fair. I'm, uh, I'm on the cusp of winding down what we do at virtual CSD as well. Uh, I don't think virtual CSD is going to go away anytime soon. Maybe not ever. It's hard to say. Uh, but I am going to start balancing that with my uh, local in-person organizing as well. There's only so many events I can organize uh, before uh, before I organize myself out of my actual job. <laughs> when are you going to make that transition, Jay? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm looking at late June, early July. Uh, so our our main venue 
uh, just reopened. In fact, today where I just attended the grand opening before I came here. And, uh, and so now that our, our venue is back, uh, we're looking at um, retaking our typical Wednesday slot. So we're going to do it every other week. Um, I think every other week is crucial right now because what it allows for is uh, our dancers to self-report. So if, you know, anyone's experiencing flu-like or COVID-like symptoms, then we can self-report within the community and understand when and if transmission is occurring. Uh, and so having it at two week intervals is, is crucial to that, at least for now. So we'll be going every other, I think. And um, so my event, the six, I mean, this, this six song dance party event, it, because it started virtually just because it started for me on like the first day of, of lockdown when they told us like, you can't be your job anymore, go home. And I was like, I got emotions to move through. What am I going to do with this dance, of course, because that's how I always move through things. And so I started it that day by just posting something on Facebook and, and saying, hey, come dance with me. We're going to do six songs. Here it goes. And it was great. So I just kept doing it every day. So it, it has never been and it never will be an in-person event because it is it's six songs, you know, you just turn on your computer and you dance a bit and then you do whatever you go back to whatever you're, you were doing. So, um, it, but it has been such, such a blessing. And so I'm not sure how long I'm going to continue it because I still like, I still, I, I, there's a part of me that like wants to be out in the world doing all these things. But every time I go to these dances, I'm like, oh, that's what I needed, you know? So, We'll see. Yeah. Well, so, you know, one of my goals uh, with the remaining time in our virtual sphere uh, is to empower, especially our sister scenes that have been so dedicated to virtual CSD throughout the pandemic. Uh, I want to make sure to empower their organizers and their safety teams and get them the tools necessary to reopen safely on their own. So that's, uh, that's going to be a focus of some of the conversations that we're having over summer at virtual CSD is, is, you know, what do you need and how do you get there, right? And so a big part of that is actually um, retraining uh, DJs and, and organizers, right? So we've all lost a lot of people. And some of the smaller scenes like Penn State, for example, uh, are going to struggle to just field enough organizers to, to host these events. And so, uh, so I'm definitely want, you know, I'm looking at retraining DJs to help with those needs. Uh, and also virtual uh, provides a really cool platform. Uh, I don't have to be in person to DJ an event. Obviously there's advantages to that. Uh, but uh, for example, Mission Fusion this Saturday, I'm DJing and that's gonna be a half virtual, half in-person event. So I'll be DJing to both groups simultaneously. So I'm, lo I'm looking forward to that. That'll be my first hybrid dance event that I've done. And so uh, I'm very interested in what these hybrid events look like and how this plays out, because uh, I think there's some big opportunities there, you know, for the ongoing virtual engagement, especially in the realm of accessibility, right? So uh, dancers with kids is a big thing. I know at your events too, Tova, uh, dancers with families can really find it hard to travel to dance events, uh, you know, or your former dancers that have moved away. Uh, or people living with at-risk family members, right? Or, or have a, you know, so we have one dancer who works in an assisted living facility. He's likely not looking at coming back to in-person dances anytime soon because it's just too much risk to assume uh, for those residents of the facility he works at. And so, you know, virtual integration still has a really important role to play in that sense. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how we can hybridize these kind of events. Also because the communities have, be I mean, it's become so international, national, international. Yeah, right? And so it feels very much like, like it feels like a new community, not like bits of different communities, but a brand new community. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I like local dancers, I think I'm, sitting somewhere around 20 to 30% on a regular virtual CSD night. 
it's you know it's people all over the country it's you know it's rochester and ann arbor and atlanta and orlando and it's it's been wonderful we have so many new sister communities that we're so connected to in a way that never were before i didn't even know rochester had a fusion scene before before pandemic and now i'm now i've got plans to spend a lot of time in rochester as soon as it's safe to do so nice so jay you mentioned like accessibility is a reason that virtual events might continue like what are the, some of the things that you do want to keep that you've learned from virtual communities? And what are some of the things mm. both of you are kind of like raring to get rid of? Yeah, okay. So I think that there's, so there's two really big things that I wanna keep that I, that I like two like crucial lessons that I, I don't think I'll ever forget as an organizer. Um, and that, so the, the first one is simply, uh, Joyfulness is more important than production quality. And, and that, you know, I know it doesn't sound like, but, but to, to put more of a point on that, like if, if your goal is to produce the biggest extravaganza and the flashiest show, um, a lot of times you, you, you end up um, creating a spectacle at the expense of the individual and especially at the expense of your organizing team. And uh, it's such a common sentiment among dance organizers that you don't enjoy your own events. And um, I've enjoyed every single event I've, I've put together, even the biggest ones I've put together in the virtual sphere. And, uh, and I really take that forward with me uh, because I'm done hating my own events. That's, I'm not going back to that. Um, so that that I think is is the most important lesson for me personally, um, and then I think the other big lesson is uh, DJs have a lot of room for improvement, uh, and and so and it's engagement. DJs need to get comfortable on the mic. They have a wealth of knowledge about their music that they don't share with the dancers, and we've shown in in the virtual world that just giving dancers a little bit not lengthy diatribes about the history of a song. I'm talking about like, hey, I love this artist because he does these things, right? Or, you know, this is the meaning of this song. So when you listen to the lyrics, key in, because here's our deeper meaning, and this is the emotional state that the song wants to take you to. And, and that can add so much depth and meaning for our dancers. And we haven't been doing that. And the virtual world, everyone's on the mic all the time. Right. So it's a lot easier in a virtual dance event to just like pop on and be like, hey, this is Tadra Call and he is amazing for these reasons. Right. And so I plan on providing mics to all of my DJs at future events and in encouraging them to, to add context to their music, you know, to add silly physical challenges, to, to just diversify what they're doing in their sets. Because that's been the key to creating really good virtual events. And there's no reason to drop that just because we're going back to in-person. I really like what you said, Jay, about, um, it's so, the, 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 the ability to enjoy your events as a dance organizer, organizer, it's true. I hadn't thought about that because back when I organized in-person events, you know, like I, I hosted a, a really huge tango festival and I would just like run around looking at what fires I could put out. And even if I couldn't find right. fires to put out, I would just keep going from place to place. Like there's got to be something, and, yeah, you know, just train to be yeah. like on edge. Yeah. And so I could enjoy it from a like, like enjoying seeing other people enjoy, but definitely in these virtual events, it feels like a requirement that I enjoy because my energy is part of what fuels the enjoyment of the people on the in the on the screen is what I was going to say, but you know, it's on the screen and and in real life. Um, and I think that one way that that one way that that does happen in these virtual events that I'm curious to see if people can bring 
to life in real life. So one thing that my huge, that my biggest tango festival did have was that we had costume themes every single night. Um, and they were really unusual ones. Like we had the vertical milonga, the natural world, the transportation milonga, the um, uh, all sorts of things, golden age. And so people would, people would like plan for these for months and get their costumes ready, blah, blah, blah. And that is something that a lot of organizers emulated later. We also did, we also did a lot of things. We did, we did tango games and we set up tango, like all of these playful things that people could do. And so you had to really plan for all of those because everybody has to bring their props to the events, bring their costumes to the events. Whereas in the virtual world, somebody will pick something up near them and then somebody else will be like, oh, I got something like that. And you'll see them run off the screen for a second and then and then they are back and, you know, and we're all just like playing with our plants and flowers, you know? Um, <laughs> And, and that's such a no. fun part of virtual events. Um, it's it's one of the one of the sweetest parts, I think, because it's just so silly. It can get so silly so quick. Right? Yeah, I I will say. So we had our first dance, uh, my first in person dance on Saturday. So like three days ago, Saturday, um, and I did do physical challenges. And uh, they, they didn't really participate. So it's going to, it's, I, I still think that those things like prop challenges and silly physical challenges, like different ways to embody the music. I still think that that is an important step forward in the art of DJing. And so I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to give them a little time to get, get used to it. it. It took a while to get used to it in, in the virtual environment as well. So, you know, it's not like, you know, March hit and we're all like, great, I got a prop box. No, <laughs> built that prop box over a year of being silly. Yeah, yeah, I definitely have several. Like I keep it near my screen all the time. Just random things I might want to use. You know, there's a whole, Never know. A whole section, a whole section. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it'll be interesting because there is a way of, I know that even for me, somebody who loves silliness at any, I was gonna say at live events, but any event, um, there is a way of inspiring it. And, and I think it has to do with creating this energy of like, bring whatever you've got anything is possible it's um it's hitting that like um like it's tickling them right in that spot of like mm -hmm. how can we play together you know yeah yeah and i i think a lot of it is just like create making sure we're creating those environments that encourage and allow for that yeah. right and and so you know like you were just saying you know, like we got to live the example, right? You can't just call out a challenge and be like, you know, this, this song's name is Lion, so you need to embody the lion. Like you need to get out there and do that and get out in front of people and lead that charge. And I think once we're doing that, you know, as DJs and organizers, I think that we'll empower the rest of our community to engage in that kind of silliness. And that's, that's, that's a dance world I want to live in. Awesome, you do. So one of the things I think that I'm hearing as you told me is like, what I've known about like dance things on Zoom is you get burnout, like you get screen burnout and you get inspiration drain. And so the props, like in part there's a like, we need to step it up because there's a lack. Like we need to compensate for something that's already going on. Like, do you worry that when we get back to live events, people won't feel the lack, they'll want to do their own thing? Like, cause I know, yeah, yeah. Like did virtual events create more of a in the room community? And is that going to go away? Well, I'm gonna do my best not to let it go away. 
Um, I, I think, uh, no, I, I think the, the richness is at least for me is here to stay. Uh, and, and for sure, you know, thinking back to, to last Saturday, um, while the challenges didn't go over that well, partially because for the most part, they had never been challenged to dance like a lion before. Um, but the, the steel dance and the, the snowball that I called were very well received. So that's just a familiarity thing. Right. And, and so I, I think that those elements are going to be very welcomed. Uh, and I, I think it does add richness to the experience uh, regardless. Is it strictly necessary? Probably not as much, but uh, but I know the snowball was pretty crucial to call early on just to get people moving again, to get them connected and partnered because some of them hadn't danced with another human in a year. Mm-hmm. You keep talking about dancing like a lion and I'm like, when do we get to do that? Um, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I, don't, I, I don't find... You know, people keep talking about the Zoom burnout, and I just, I, I, I don't understand it. Anytime people say that, because I feel like Zoom has so much variety and possibility that there's like there's just so many different ways to connect here that to me it doesn't feel like the same thing. However, I don't work for my job on Zoom, so maybe that's why. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, the, the second part of your question, I want to, oh, um, uh, and also I feel like the, I feel like the playfulness that has come up so easily through virtual, that it might not be because of a lack in virtual, it might be because of a gift of, that virtual brings, which is that, um, because of this distance, because we're not in the same physical space, vulnerability feels less scary. And so th- like, this is something that a lot of different virtual events that I have been part of have found is that it, it feels easier to be vulnerable in this space than to be vulnerable in face-to-face with somebody. And so I think that's why the, the the playfulness has been able to bloom more and that there and that there are ways like you're saying to like sort of work people up in person to the vulnerability that we could get in a virtual event yeah i think so that was some wisdom just dropped right there i felt it <laughs> Well, yeah, actually, half an hour flies by. I want to, like, I've asked a lot of questions. What are the things that you both want to say to people, like, about, or each other, like, about virtual events and, like, going back live or not going back live or what they are or what they can do? Or you mentioned, like, you've built your prop box up over the year. What what are the things you've built into your toolbox that you, like, are really fond of. I mean, I love dancing with ropes and feathers and sunglasses. Those are some highlights. But I like doing that in person too, because you know, I do fight dancing and sometimes we get ropes involved there too. And in fact, just two days ago, I got to do fight dancing in person. Oh, geez, so missed, (laughs) so missed. Yeah, I think um, I think that the main things I want to say is when you're reopening, trust is crucial, and, and you need to build trust in your with your community among your community members. And so, focus on trust early on uh, in the reopening, um, and also uh, you're not alone. You're not alone. We're very connected right now because of the virtual environment. Um, I feel more connected to my fellow organizers, teachers, and DJs than I ever have been. And, uh, and so you're not alone. Reach out and ask for help if you need it. Uh, reach out and ask for resources. You have access to DJs and teachers all over the country right now. And so, like, we all have the ability 
to reopen successfully. And if you, you don't feel that you have those resources, then, uh, then ask for them. I'd like to highlight that actually, because Jay in particular, you have been such a connector and such a, such a connector, like making sure that organizers know each other and are like being there for each other, but also in, like you were talking about providing resources so that we can all, so that everyone can up their game and, and take care of each other. And it's, and so, yes reach out to jay i mean reach out to me sure but i'm probably gonna send you to jay <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fine i'm happy all of you come on in let me let me help you find your way please this is my my last big act on the the virtual stage is to send us all home you mean it's home to a, a dance floor not in your home preferably <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. That was wonderful. Um, I am now going to turn over to the portion of the event where everyone else gets to join in this discussion um, and ask you questions. So folks, if you would like, if you are sat here to unmute or to turn on your camera, um, but while everybody gets their text sorted out, I get to do the really exciting part, which is I get to announce the schedule for the rest of June. So Hold on just a second. I will do this. Change my Zoom settings. So now I can see who's in the room. And so, are you ready to be excited? Yes. Awesome. So, next week, June 8th, we have Juliet McMains and Mark Carpenter. They are going to be talking about partnering and gender. On June 15th, we have Sydney Schiff and Ruby Rambo. They're talking about training for dance because we're all a little out of shape right now. Um, on June 22nd, we have a Gray double feature. We have Gray Armstrong and Ivy Gray coming to talk about racism in dance communities. And our last talk for June is we have Anne Tronson and Voice Porter who are two fantastic local organizers here. They're going to be talking about arts engagement and funding. Um, and then we've got four more talks in July. So it is going to be an incredible couple of months um, for people who want to think about dance and the future of our communities. It's a solid lineup. It's so fun. People give me their time I'm and they come and talk to me about cool things and yeah. Like, I, I love this series. I'm so glad everyone is here. And now everyone is here. Um, friends, who has questions for Tova and Jay? You can either drop them in the chat or you can come out, come out wherever you are and ask them in person. And in the meantime, we will be lions. <laughs> um. Um. I'm sorry, y'all can totally ask questions. <laughs> I, have I tell you what, let's so, have a lion moment after the camera goes off, because I think I see Cindy with a question, and is that Tara with a question also? Okay, well, Cindy, let's start with you. I just wondered if I know personally Zoom makes me more comfortable like if I was trying to dance or something because I wouldn't feel like everybody could see me mess up is is that a crutch I wouldn't necessarily need could that be I guess could that be detrimental no I don't think it, it's detrimental necessarily um it, it can be it's if if it's a good gateway for you then that's wonderful. For some people, it's actually exactly the opposite. They feel like everyone can see into their living room and they feel like spied upon. And so, you know, it just depends on how you feel about the entire Zoom experience and how comfortable you are with it. And if that's your gateway into social dance, then, then that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And then 
what will happen when you do venture out. Who knows, but also exciting. Now Tara's got a question. Hit it, Tara. Um, I was asking about possibly, so when live events do happen again, what about um, live streaming possibly? I don't know. I know that we'd have to, we'd have like consent things for that, but um, just a thought. I'm going to mute myself now. Yeah, I, I think hybrid events have an important role in the recovery. I, I don't know if that's necessarily a long-term thing, but short term as a part of the recovery, hybrid events are, are going to be crucial, uh, partly to enable accessibility for, for, you know, people living with, with high risk family members, for example, right? Um, and then also it helps uh, little scenes. So a lot of the sister scenes uh, near to Penn State uh, just don't have a ton of resources, a ton of people right now. And so until we can get back to public recruiting, because that's not what we're doing right now, uh, I wanna be very clear, like I ran that event Saturday, that's known dancers only all have their vaccine status verified with safety. Um, so when I talk about trust, that that's how we're building it. And, and so, you know, we're not public recruiting right now, which means our numbers are very limited. And so uh, hybrid events are going to provide a crucial bridge to providing access to teaching and DJing resources that you might not have in your local community uh, and also providing accessibility to people who aren't ready yet to come back to in-person dances. So, yeah, I definitely will be, you know, pursuing that avenue and, and uh, if you need help uh, working out what that looks like and how that, how that works for your community, let me know. I want to think, because you know, I think with the hybrid experience, I'm going to jump on this one for a second, there's the idea that, like, we don't want Zoom to become, like, the lesser experience, especially because it's such an accessibility issue. And I'm thinking like at a lot of dancers, we used to have like volunteer jams. We used to have a moment where everyone was like, we're gonna recognize the people who are going out of their way for this community. We should have like an everybody turn to the screen and we appreciate the people joining us by Zoom. Like we should have road yeah. trips where a scene goes, okay, tonight we're all gonna show up on Zoom at this community's dance and we're gonna dance with the people. Like I like, you were talking about Zoom uh, Toba being a gift. Like, how can it be a gift as we keep going forward and not just like social dancing at half speed or like diet social dancing? Right, yes. Yeah, and I love that focus on Zoom moving forward, on Zoom being an, an accessibility, a, a way that people with, with all different sorts of reasons can connect with a dance scene. That feels really important. We have a question in the chat from Alice um, and she says, will you be tracking to see if there are any new COVID-19 variants that the vaccine isn't effective against? I'm heartened that the vaccine so far seems to be regionally good against all variants, but I'm concerned that this might change so that in-person dancers wouldn't be safe until a booster shot is developed. Thoughts? Yeah, yikes. That is a serious concern. Um, so uh, so I, I'm particularly blessed being in a, in a college scene. One of my former dancers now has her PhD in epidemiology, and she's been reviewing all of our policies and standards. Uh, so it's been a really important part of, you know, like I can feel confident in what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, everything is, is very well wrapped. I think to, you were going to say well referenced. Yeah, it's it's well referenced and cross checked by by actual qualified people that are not me. That's uh, I'm a doctor of color, not of epidemiology or dance. That's not my qualifications. Um, you know, as far as like ongoing, like yeah, we're going to be very active in in staying on top of the news. We always were uh, in the past. That's. Uh, so that's just not going to change. And I, I think a big part of this is uh, committing a, a good chunk of our, our upcoming resources to safety. 
And so uh, every single organizer in my community is going to be fully safety trained. Uh, we're going to pay for uh, better health and safety training. Uh, we're going to also pay for uh, diversity training uh, for the safety team. And we're also looking at expanding our safety team. So I, I think that is a, a crucial element in this mix. Safety has a bigger role than ever before. And we need to make sure that we're getting the resources to those teams so they can do their jobs effectively, including, among other things, anticipating uh, upcoming risks and, and problems on the horizon. It's a lot of moving parts to consider. Yeah. Tova, did you want to speak to that question at all? Um, no, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm probably going to keep my, I mean, I'm, I'm going to keep my virtual event as long as, um, as long as people see, keep coming to it, I bet, you know, seems I'll like. I'll keep coming to it. Woohoo. Yay. And we have a thought from Jay and they said, I'm hoping that live streams hybrid events stay because not only is it better for those who need that accessibility, but it also allows opportunities not otherwise possible. I love being able to attend events across state lines and make new awesome connections with people without having to travel, though I'm excited to travel once that's safe again. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with every word of that. That's, that's why we need to have hybrid events uh, and why, you know, I'll, why will I'll be maintaining, you know, some form of virtual CSD for the foreseeable future. I don't know if that's permanent, uh, but I don't have any plans to cancel it as soon as I get my weekly dances back. That's, that's not, not what's going to happen. Because it's a new community. It is. It is. And I don't, I don't want to let go of it. I yeah. love my, uh, I love my virtual community. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we wouldn't get to see Kyle very often then, you know, for example. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Orlando's a long drive. Long drive. <laughs> yeah. What's the furthest everyone here has virtually traveled for an event? Because I got as far as Europe. Hmm. Huh. I mean, I, di I did my own six song dance party when I was in Australia because I had to go to Australia for work in, in November. And so my, my dance party ended up being at like six or 7 a.m. there. And I was just like, all right, let's do this, you know? <laughs> I, I have to admit, I've been pretty focused and I've mostly attended events in the US, partially because I'm trying to support the US fusion community. Um, but I think, Probably my my most hardcore dancer, and he, he he comes about once a month, so he's pretty semi regular. Uh, and I'm looking up; I can't. He's from the uh, the. Um, just gonna look it up instead of guessing wrong. Uh, anyways, uh, he uh, he attends in the morning our events. So a lot of times, the the reason he comes to our events is he'll dance through the night at his events and then stay super late just so he's awake to attend virtual CSD in his morning. He's, he's crazy. He's, he might be the only person more hardcore than Kyle. That reminds me, we have, we have one person who, who started attending, who found our events. He lives in England and he found our events mm -hmm. and, um, and, he came at 2.30 in the morning many days for a, like a long time. And he credits our events as helping him to get a job um, because it helped it like, just like being part of this community and all of the vulnerability and play and care here, like just was so supportive. And so like there, there's some really sweet stories of like virtual, virtual connections helping to build people's sense of themselves and and connections tara go ahead uh it's not a question it's uh more to add and piggyback off of tova's point um 
I met Pierce. He's actually here. I met Pierce in a uh, DFRX and I also met Ben at DFRX. Um, back in March, 2020, which is the last event I attended in the before times. And I was already collecting music passively and kind of just, uh, kind of just wanting to DJ. Um, and then Pierce is like, Oh, um, showing me the ropes and swapping music. And, um, he was really the catalyst for me DJing for Menagerie Atlanta, you know, the monthly zoom event going on. And then we, um, we can combined after a while, um, after I've been DJing for them regularly into the MO modus operandi where, so it's like Kyle, uh, Pierce, Elizabeth is here, Jeremy and myself, and I've been helping organize and I've been DJing that. So, uh, the, the, the Zoom events have been allowing me to expand on DJing, even though I haven't been at an in-person fusion event in over a year. And I really have to, uh, and, and Jay as well, because he's been at my sets and I've, I've DJed for virtual CSD before. And like, I never DJed before ever before these Zoom events. And uh, virtual CSD was my first time DJing where I had the entire, I had control over the, the entire mood of the party basically. Um, so I haven't been, I, I've been able to expand on my craft and get more involved in ways that I never thought I would. And now I'm over here going down musical rabbit holes and buying audio controllers and things like that. So it's been a gift to me in that way. And I haven't, uh, without that, I wouldn't have been able to do all this. And so all this help and all these brains I get to pick. So uh, I've been very thankful for that. Yeah, I, I dare say so. Jay, I'm going to drop you in it because I want to add to your response. I see people talking about you growing DJs. I also want to like get you to talk about the project that you did training black DJs. Oh, yeah, that was great. Uh, so, I mean, first off, credit to Kathleen uh, for putting that event together. Uh, but uh, I, you know, so early on in the pandemic, I, I was working at building training systems to empower people to to adapt to this environment and so uh so melting pot celebrates black voices was an amazing opportunity to empower a whole cohort of, of black djs and and get their voices out there uh especially early in the pandemic and and several of those djs have become really regular at at different uh fusion events and of course in uh over at uh Zook events, which is the other community that's done extremely well in the virtual environment. And so that was, yeah, no, that was a great opportunity to, to give back to the community. Um, and in general, you know, giving back to the community uh, by training is like one of my big passions. And so I, you know, I dare say the virtual DJs uh, might be better than the, the in-person DJs. In the past i mean this has been a big down. opportunity yeah no if y'all haven't been djing uh in in the virtual environment then uh you might be out of a job because our virtual djs are good i do wonder also how much because there's i feel like there are definite things that i play as a dj that i wouldn't that i play for people who are solo dancing that I wouldn't necessarily play for people who are partner dancing. And so I feel like there are differences in, ter in terms of how I have been as a DJ. I'm looking forward to that a Mango. question or a comment? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Jay. <laughs> no, that's it. I was just, more tango, more waltz, more micro. Those are the three things that have basically cut out of my sets that I, I really miss. Yeah, and where is like- the differences. Yeah, and I've added in, I mean, I haven't cut out tango, but um, you know, that's because of me, but, I, but I, I don't play it as often, that's for sure. But I have added in like straight up, like party, let's dance this dance party kind of songs, you know? I was really happy to be able to play a electronic remix of Soon May the Well Man Come. Mm, yeah. Nice. Pierce. Yeah, I just want to comment that the difference in the environment between online events and Zoom and in-person events, I think there's some overlap definitely, but there's also very different skill sets as a DJ you need to bring to 
the kind of set you build, the music you play, and the level of energy you bring, that they're not identically applicable in different environments. So, I mean, I think it's helpful in certain ways, but other ways, you know, like the approach you take is not the same. And I agree that you've trained some really awesome DJs, Jay. Well, they practically train themselves. You I just give assisted. them the tools and let them set fires. You have assisted in bringing out their magnificence. That's what a good teacher does. What about teaching dances? Ooh. Teaching, teaching dance is hard. Virtual. That I'm, I'm really, yeah, if there's one thing I'm looking forward to getting away from, it's, it's teaching and virtual. Uh, it, it's, it's so much harder to evaluate your students and give them targeted feedback because you're, you're getting a, a two-dimensional view of them. And so it's, it's very difficult to, you know, and like rhythm, rhythm has been a challenge to try to teach. Um, cause you know, how do you know, like, you know, if, like, for example, in blues, like a big part of it is, you know, like dancing in the pocket or, or like dance behind the beat. I have no idea if anyone's dancing behind the beat. I can describe it, but I have literally no idea if anyone's actually doing it. Um, so I'm really looking forward to being able to like see people in full 3D glory. Virtual fusion ballet sounds amazing. Yeah, well, and, and your, your class at CSD was amazing because I, I think some of the big differences you were just giving us prompts to explore rather than trying to like refine technique, which is really tough right now. Um, but the the more exploratory classes were was really cool. I think for me the big thing was committing to being virtual. Like I know that a lot of people wanted to really play around the hybrid land or make the like make the virtual thing look as live as possible. I had the benefit of like a session of these and if you are like I really urge people to go back and there was a last year it was Benny Simon and Kendra, Kendra Portier who are digital dance artists in the concert dance world and they gave their spiel about what they wanted to happen with virtual events and I was just like I'll take all of that please um so teaching in a way that was a virtual mode of teaching rather than live teaching adapted to a virtual environment um yes yes totally it's different i don't think it's like i don't think that any of this dance teaching djing dancing i don't think any of it is i think in the beginning we were sort of feeling like it was a lesser version and what i have come to learn is it's not a lesser version it's just simply different Wholeheartedly agree. Other questions from folks in the room? Because Kyle, I see you sat there grinning like you're thinking of everything. What do you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you're muted. Why? Oh, or he, he hasn't finished thinking the thought. Get, get All right, we will take a moment and we will wait for Kyle. How about now? Yes. Sounds great. <laughs> so, yes, I have a million questions, although uh, a lot of them were touched upon so far a little bit. Um, I was curious, and this one is a bit, I guess, specific to um, Dr. J. I was curious. Were there any, what unique observations did you um, encounter at that physical dance with um, other dancers? I'm curious to um, hear about what you might have noticed, especially, um, and compare that to what I noticed observing Mission Fusion when I, for the first time, <laughs> DJed a hybrid dance a few weeks ago and noticed 
a few things, but I was curious as to what you saw or yeah, or what stood out to you. Um, I think the biggest thing that stood out to me was how um, so safety was like gearing up and preparing with, you know, like icebreakers and, and different dance games because they, there was a real concern among the, the organizing team that um, the first dance was going to be real awkward. And so I, I think part of it, it was a small dance and we all knew each other pretty well, but I, I think the other big part of it, and I'll go back to a previous statement, building trust is so crucial right now. And if you can trust that everyone in your, your space is safe and fully vaccinated and taking acceptable precautions and uh, not putting you at any kind of risk or, or not bringing the risk of the group out to people who haven't volunteered for that risk. Um, you know, if you have that kind of trust, uh, I was shocked by how quickly the all, all of my dancers locally just jumped right back into it. And it was like the year hadn't even happened. Other than the fact of dancing outside on a basketball court in the pouring rain. But you know what? Details. That, Wait, that didn't slow down at all. They were hungry. That was outside on a basketball court in the pouring rain? True facts. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. It was raining all weekend. We couldn't move it because it rained all day Friday, Saturday, and Sunday here. I know, I know. And so there was no avoiding it. We're like, we're like, are we going to cancel the event? So we just like, like we kept our original plan and all but one dancer showed up and no one left early. Zero people left early. They made me play extra music. And I'm like, are y'all not like freezing to death out here? They were lions. Yeah. They were so hungry. They were, hungry they're hungry. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that really stood out to me. I, I was surprised by how quickly the the community was was just ready to get back to it. Yep. I don't know about the surprise though. I get it. I think we all Yeah, the surprise rain. Yeah, yeah. But the <laughs> rain, maybe. Okay, you got a point there. Dancing in the rain in on a basketball court okay there's a lot of dedication there but i think that yeah we've been waiting mm -hmm. i will say the rain made the, the court nice and slick so um as long as i was dancing the right part of the court i could turn pretty nicely <laughs> benefits there's been see just another point there's benefits to everything silver lining to all things yep and that I think is a fantastic note to pause on. Unless there are any more burning questions that people have, I will give you five seconds to wave at me. I will give you the time, I promise. Thanks for the countdown, please. <laughs> All right. So this is the next question. Use your reactions or give me a thumbs up. Who wants to turn off the camera and be a lion? Turn off? Turn, turn off the recording. Oh. All right. <laughs> then in which case, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. I am going to stop recording. <laughs>